All this is Dr. Mobin Sayed from this cafe live. And first of all, why am I not shaven? So I went for acupuncture today and they also did some cupping. The story is that they, these are medical students and they wanted to experiment on someone and me being the medical doctor, I said, fine, I am here. So anyways, after their cupping exercises on me, they asked me not to take a shower. So this morning when I had taken a shower, I had not shaved. So I am a little uh, scruffy today. So that's that. Now, the second thing, today I'm going to become a little philosophical with you about art. I think you would like it. And I'm going to borrow this book's concepts to, uh, to talk about the philosophy. So this is a beautiful book. It is called Understanding Comics. And then it says The Invisible Art. And this is by Scott McLeod. I would love if you can have it. This is a beautiful book. It is such an enlightening book that I think anyone who wants to do any kind of art, paintings or drawings or symbols or whatever, they should first read this. So, why I'm going to become philosophical is that today I was going to talk about, and I am going to talk about, Asaro's head. Asaro's head is a model. And let me share my screen to show you what it is. So this model here on the left, this is on sketchfab.com. This is Asaro's head. So throughout the history, many, many artists painters have tried to figure out or not tried to actually figured out the planes of our face as simple as we can say our face has two eyes and a nose and a mouth and ears and hair and the structure it is actually a very complex structure in terms of how many muscles make it and the 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 planes of the face and the bends of the planes and so on. So professional artists have been over centuries trying to figure out what are the planes. So Asaro's head is a simplification of these planes for us to understand how light reflects from our, our face. And why do we want to know this? Whenever you're going to draw a face, the underlying structure is the same for everyone in terms of what are the, the planes of the face, what are the surfaces of the face, and where do these surface point. So if I take this little pen here in my hand, and let me go back to my full view. So let's say this is, this is my face, your face, and let's say you only have one light at it. Right now I have two lights, so it is lit from two sides. But imagine if it was only lit from one side. What would happen is that light would fall on this side, for example, and this side would become lit. But this side will not have light, and this side would be in the dark. So what happens is, if you have various planes and bends of the planes, and you put tangents to them, any plane that is at a tangent to the light will be brighter and any plane that is away from the light is going to be darker. And then any plane that is turning will have a gradation of from light to dark. So Asaro's head uh, is an exercise for art students to learn various planes of the face. And if you see here, this Asaro's head, and you can buy them as hard uh, material head as well. And there are many 3D online systems too. So if you see here, on one side, it is it is less detailed. Just the major planes, for example, here's a cheek and here is the eye socket. And this is the other plane of the cheek. And on the other hand, this side is a little more detail. 
So you start from this side and you start understanding how the planes of the face interact with light and then you go more in detail. Over here in this particular case, my problem is I do not know how to move the light on it. I'm sure there is in these settings, there is some way to work with the lights, but I just do not know how to. So don't uh, don't mind it. There are many sites where you can move the light and see which plane would look in what way. Now, before we actually work with the SRO's head today, I want to now go back to that book. And let me actually do this thing. If you see here, there are two pictures that you can see. One is this one. This is the one that we have been <laughs> drawing, right? <laughs> For some time, right? So this is one. This These are the ones that you see more often in my um, diagrams too. And that is, these are the ones that we've been drawing. And then if you see here on the left side, this is the Asaro's head. Or even I can bring in some more images. So let's say um, celebrity pictures and just pick up some celebrity. And again, don't mind this. This celebrity looks more like an Asaro's head, whoever he is. So here. So what is the difference in the picture on the right versus the picture on the left? That is what Scott discusses. So I'm going to go for three main concepts here. So if you see in this book, let me make myself bigger. So in this book here, he shows, he goes from a simplified face all the way towards more detail, right? You can, you can see here. And what he says is that people are actually more attracted towards the simplified faces, towards this just two eyes and a nose, more than this detailed renderings. And there is a reason, the reasons. So I'm going to read some reasons to you. So number one, he says, universally of cartoon imagery, so the, that little just symbol-like structure, the more cartoony a face is, for instance, the more people it could be said to describe. So this, this little cartoony face, this little cartoony face, this could be a cell, <laughs> the, the way I make them, the cell, or this could be a person, this could be me, this could be you, this could be someone else. Because it is just so simplified, you, you could project anyone on it, right? And that allows you to think more in diverse ways for, a, for an icon versus a fully rendered picture. So first of all, the more simpler it is, Scott says, the more faces it describes. Then he says that the, the more iconic it is, the more easy it is for an artist to project what they are trying to say. For example, if I'm drawing a cell, drawing a cell, and I want to show that the cell is angry, and all I do is make the eyebrows and the angry eyes and I'm done, then the only thing you're going to see on that face is that angry look. And all of a sudden, I would have accomplished my goal. So let's say here is that cell and I just did this much. And I'm done. I'm, I'm not doing anything else. I'm not creating any other details, nothing. And all of a sudden, it has relayed to you what I'm trying to say, an angry cell. Right? But if I have a lots of uh, rendering, so let's say I, if I make a face here, all of a sudden, it's my duty now to somehow figure out that this face, this mouth should also convey 
the idea of anger. It should jive with this. Then if I have the ears and I have, let's say, the body and I have the, the hands, then the whole thing has to be uh, shown correctly. And the idea, the chances of things breaking down, at least for me, naive artist, are going to become more. So sometimes just easier <laughs> for drawing the least amount and show the focal area of your message. So that is another important point that uh, Scott makes. Then he says that we are very much. So here, I'm so sorry, I keep going to the larger and smaller print. So here, if you see, he says that we are processors of images and we are very good at detecting faces faces and so that is why we see faces everywhere in the sockets and in other places so again as simple as a face maybe it would easily be detectable then he says that th there was one more point here which was very interesting so let me go to that. Yeah. So here he makes another very interesting point here. If a face is rendered fully, then it is very difficult for you to put yourself in that position because that face is already depicting someone else. But if a face is not rendered fully, then it becomes very easy for you to project yourself on it. And many times when we are reading comics or cartoons or we're doing that, we are actually projecting ourselves or our friends or our families, depending upon the cartoon's state. And it is easier if the cartoon is simpler. Otherwise, for example, let me give you the example of this here. So let me just make sure that I know who this is. Fake Facebook post about The Rock. Okay, so this is The Rock, right? So if you see this face and then you want to project you on him, then it would not be very much easy to say, this is me. On the other hand, if you looked at this symbol, <laughs> these symbols, it would probably be easier to project yourself or project someone else, family member, a friend. You could think of it, oh, this looks like my friend X, or this is me, or this is my that family member when they're angry, or this is myself when it is angry. So the important thing that when we are doing these cartoony-like things, as much as in painterly world, it is shunned to think about cartoony or symbolic art because the problem becomes that, let's say you're trying to paint a face, but your, your memory, your visual memory knows that the face is made up of an eye and you, are, you have become uh, trained from your childhood, from the school age to make eyes like this and then a nose like this and then a mouth like this. And so what would happen is you would just try to make these things, which I do, do as well. And then all of a sudden, everything is going to be a similar outcome, right? And then it may not be the correct way. The correct way, if you see the paintings or portraits, there are no lines in them. There are only lights and shadows. And that you can only achieve once you understand how to do the light and shadow part. But this kind of art, cartoony art, symbolic art, comic art, has lines. And the simpler you keep them, the easier you make it for the reader or viewer to actually interpret them and project themselves onto them. So with this, when... Why did I have this little <laughs> discussion philosophy? Because when we look at Asaro's face, 
if you are going to draw just for fun and you just want to make some cartoony things and happy faces and sad faces and people in action, little cartoons in action, then Asaro's head is not something that is interesting. But if somebody is going to start drawing or painting um, portraits or want to draw a little more detail, then understanding the Asaro's head and the planes of the face will actually be valuable. So those who want to become painters of the portraits, they actually start with these kind of things, Asaro's heads, and then they go from there. So with this, <laughs> so let's see how the comments are going. Uh, Siddhartha says, love your drawings. Thank you very much. John Snyder <laughs> says, he looks angry. Yes. Uh, then something is going on. Robin. Robin, uh, hopefully you recover uh, soon. Prayers. John Snyder says, are we sure that is the rock? I have no idea. If he's the rock, then he's the rock. So um, I'm going to go back to the discussion here. So if we look at the Asaro's head, the benefit of that is that when we are drawing a face, we could do a little more justice to the face if we wanted to. I have never cared. The only thing I care for in my cartoony faces is the following. If it is a mature face, the eyes are a little higher on the face. If it is a baby face, then the face compared to the body is bigger plus the, the um, even this does not look like a baby face. The, um, the facial features are low set. So baby's head area is bigger than the, the face area. And then as they grow, their jaw grows and they start growing and the face becomes elongated and or bigger. But in the beginning, it is this way. So if you wanna wanted to make a baby, then the body should be small, head should be big, the faces, fe features should be a little low set. If you wanted to make a uh, an adult, so see, even this adult's body is smaller than this baby's body, but still this looks like an adult compared to this. And the reason is that baby's head proportion is bigger than the body or compared to body, it looks bigger. And secondly, for an adult, the features go up. And I think the higher up they go, the more older the person would look. So I just care for this much. <laughs> or I care for how to draw an angry face versus sad face versus happy face. Asaro's head is going to be interesting to draw if you wanted to do a little more. For example, first of all, what they th these folks have been doing, they have a an oval usually that they use for their basic drawing. Then they cut it in half above the half. So if you see here as well, above the half are the eye area. And between the eye area, between the two eyes, there is usually one eye distance. Then in eye long length is the nose. And usually just below that is the a little cliff and then the mouth. So this is another half. Then there is half here of the last third part. That is where the mouth is. And then the fourth part, this half, is where the chin is. So number one, it can help us cut the areas in the face where various features go. And normally they are that way for everyone. Again, as the people grow older, these facial features start moving up on the face. As they are younger, the facial features are below on the face. Now the second part. So let's make one more face here and let's start from just one part forehead so you can actually right now uh, run a finger on your forehead and you can actually see that the forehead 
has a frontal plane so a plane in the front and then turning parts turning parts like this now it is interesting these are soft turns these are not hard edges so when you are drawing Asaro's head or the planes of the face, you could do something like this that you could take. Let's decide where the light is. Let's say the light is here. My drawings always have the light from top right. And that would mean this part of the forehead will be lit. So let's not color it. Then this part which is now away from the light will be little lit. Ideally, it is more lit here and less lit here so it would be something like that but let's say it is lit and then the other side that is turned away from the light that has that is more in dark so if you see just by this treatment you can always already see that there is a shape of this set of uh, polygons and that shape shows that this is a three-dimensional structure and it kind of gives you an idea that the light is shining here it is somewhat shining here as well and very less over here right and if you then take let's say various colors and remove these lines you would see that that illusion of the three-dimensional shape would, would hold because that illusion is now not held together because of the lines, but instead that illusion is held together because of the shading, the illusion of light and shade. So understanding <laughs> Robin says, Azara's head is really misshapen. His cheeks are out of whack. So these are planes and they have accentuated the planes for the student to practice. And then everybody has planes which are different. They may have slightly different. The shape of the plane may be size, proportion, angle. But this is for basic uh, planes. And these planes are actually based on underlying bones and the muscles. So if I go back here, you can actually now see that even without lines, this area, the forehead area, gives an idea of a rounded structure. Now, ideally, what should have happened is that there should have been a gradation. So for example, let's say this is dark, then this is slightly dark and then like this. And similarly, there should have been a gradation here as well. Right? And that would give you an idea that I did a lot of wrong gradation. But anyways, if there is more gradation, that gives you an idea of soft bend. If there is hard gradation, like we are seeing here, then this line where the gradation is, where the change in uh, value is, that shows a, a hard edge even when there is no line there although this edge acts as a line so this is the first part of the asaro's head the forehead has multiple actually uh, planes right now we are looking at three main planes that are on the front there is actually another plane even more on the side which is here and so if i had to put lines there is a plane here this plane and then it is this 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 one this one and then here so these are the planes of the forehead now again you can keep looking at your own forehead as well and or, or run, running a finger on it then if you come down to the eyebrows you would see something very interesting the top of the eyebrow especially in men actually faces upwards so there is a the top of the eyebrow the the bone underneath 
actually faces upwards. So if there is a light that is coming down from the top, this part would be lit because there is a kind of upward tangent there. So that's very interesting. Women usually have a more straighter forehead towards the eyebrows. And this is actually a secondary sex character as well of men. This is produced because of the testosterone. And that is that the bone, the skull bone, this upper part of the orbital cavity or this orbit, it kind of protrudes a little bit. And those children who have a lot of growth hormone, you would see that their forehead is bossy. We call it bossing of the forehead, where it becomes too strong and too much projected. So we could have those. So if you look at this Asaro's head, this little part here, which they have not separately shown, but there is a, a tendency of projecting upwards. Now look at the middle part of where forehead is going to connect with the nose. That area is actually this little trapezoid area and it faces downward. So this area, this area, which I'm pointing with my finger, it is actually, if the forehead is facing frontwards, then this plane is looking downwards. So if there is a light that is falling on the head from the front, this would be a little bit in shadow. So this little area here would be in shadow. A little more in shadow, but then I have to change the intensity everywhere else. And once again, if I wanted, I can remove the lines and it would still read as if these are bends on the face, right? And now if you look at the nose, just looking at bigger, uh, I have to see, just this little line here actually makes you feel that this has become wrong if I increase the size of it. See, this little change in value is incorrect because all of a sudden it is saying that this part is facing upwards because it is more lit than this, which is wrong. And so if I remove this, you would actually feel better about it. So if I take this and I remove these lines, you would still feel that this is an area of the face that is facing downwards. Because it is relatively darker compared to this area. Um, Casey says, what is the medical explanation for females having forehead bossing? Uh, genetics. So there are actually some uh, families where genetically female bones are slightly different and then possibility of hormonal uh, irregularity as well. But if everything is fine, then genetics. <laughs> Nicolene says, love that the way Dr. Bean explains with such detail and ease in respect of the su subject matter, talented teacher. Thank you. Teachers are just <laughs> tools, <laughs> not bad thing. They're just a tool to convey one kind of knowledge and change it into another. So um, bossing can occur in females if they're... Uh, the maternal hormonal levels can also cause change in the structure while she, the baby was in the mother. Okay, so now we have the this sort of area which is connecting with the bridge of the nose. And now if you look at Asaro's head, the nose itself has this structure that if you see it goes little inwards, then it goes a little bit out then back here, and then it has this little structure. Again, I didn't hold the, the... Then if you see the side of the nose, 
that also has its plane. So if you see here, it's like this, then there is a triangular plane, then there is this plane over here, and then the nostril has its planes too. And again, uh, my proportions are not correct. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to put the front of the nose is if you look at uh, your nose, my nose, other people's noses, the the nose comes from a depressed area and it projects forward most of the time. And um, some people have varying structures of the nose. Some people have rounding nose. Some people have protruding tip of the nose. Some people have a more formed butt of the nose and so on. So there are tons of ways the noses are. But generally, they start from a lower area and they go higher and they are a this, I don't want to call it pyramidal, but sort of this trapezoid structure. So the, the front part of that is in front of you and that is why it would be as bright as let's say the this area, right? So you could become a little more subtle with it and start from less dark. I don't have those many values here. Less dark because it is projecting upwards to actually that whole thing would stay that way. Just here, maybe a little darkness and then it projects upwards. So that is a nose. I'm just going to keep it consistent with one. Now you could see that this level and this level, because their value intensity is the same, they seem like plain, flat planes. Even when you know that this is going to be a nose and it's going to change its, its uh, height, even then you know that it is not changing its height because it is just one value. And that one value matches this value. So it gives you an idea that this is a front face a plane, then there is a depression, then again a flat thing. There is no indication of any elevation of the nose end. And that elevation, you could start producing that thing by starting to create shadows around it. And so those would be then more um, planes to look at. So if you look at the Asaro's head, one second. If you look at the Asaro's head, okay, so I, if you look at the Asaro's head, the nose seems like it is protruding here because there are these lower planes which are darker. And they give an idea of depression here, that means this part must be elevated. And how do artists handle this? What they do is, look, I'm going to do something to this nose and it's going to seem like it is elevated. And that is, I'm going to put a little highlight here on the nose. And let me remove the other lines, the blue lines, just so that we can So regardless of this being a good nose or not, you could see that this little highlight here actually is trying to show that this part of the nose is elevated. So uh, if you look at the old masters and look at the portraits that they make, there are just a couple of areas in the face where they put highlights. So there are highlights in the eyes for sure, but then tip of the nose, and lip is where they have highlights and everything else just has relative values. And by this, they kind of create that volumes perception. So I'm going to stop, <laughs> stop here. So this is the beginning of the Asaro's head. We'll continue with the Asaro's head. I would recommend that you also look at Asaro's head and try to draw these planes. If you know how to draw the planes, you can then layer on anybody's facial features and you can, uh, you can go from there. And I also wanted to show you something.
look what I got. This was outside of my um, <laughs> door today. And these were fully bloomed flowers. They have now withered. This is dandelion. And we were talking about dandelion leaf extracts a couple of days ago. <laughs> so this is the discussion for today. I hope this was um, interesting. <laughs> John says Dr. Bean is about to be censored. I think I, I was okay. <laughs> Thank you, Nicolene. <laughs> DDS says, I think it spent too much time fasting. Who? So, Skyfrog says, pass my bedtime. Good night, Skyfrog. And with this, um, Robin says, that's interesting about a baby's face. Yes. So with this, let's break for today. Tomorrow, we would also have this. And Meeple Art, apologies. The best thing is that you join us and you teach us art. Or you can add some comment as well and kind of criticize or correct things that I say incorrectly because you are an artist. Um, and with this, thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, and share. And I would see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.